that. Take your Bibles tonight and let's turn over to the book of Luke chapter 17, if you would. Luke chapter 17, and we're going to look at verse 26 and verse 27. You find your place, let's stand. We'll read these two verses and then we'll pray. Luke chapter 17 and verse number 26, and it says, And as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it also in the days of the Son of Man. They did eat, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark, and the flood came and destroyed them all. Father, again tonight, thank you for the special music. I pray now that you'd bless as we look into the Word of God tonight. And Lord, I pray that we would be very aware of the times we're living. And what lies ahead, Lord, and especially for those of us that are saved tonight, we have a responsibility, Lord, more now than ever before, to reach this lost and dying world. Bless the service tonight, Father, and we're going to give you the praise, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. You know, we talked for three weeks on being in the will of God, and I believe this, if we're in the will of God, we ought to be thinking about the end. And the end is coming. And that's what I want to speak about tonight, considering the end. Uh, we, we often, if it's not before us, we don't think about it. But the end is before us. The end is approaching us. And I think about it all the way back when Noah was building the ark of how God used Noah to, what was the intent of that ark? It was not to destroy mankind, but it was to what? Save mankind. That's why the ark was built. But unfortunately, there were only eight people that were on that ark that were saved. There should have been a multitude. And I wonder today, how many are we going to take with us when the end comes? Or how many are going to be left behind just like those that rejected the message of God in Noah's day and were outside the doors of that ark? Uh, tonight, I want to stop and think about the return of Christ. And I have, I really believe in my heart it could be any day. I mean, if you see the things that are going on in this world and how things are building and how things are, the wars and the rumors of war and everything that's going along with that, his return could be at any time. And, the, and this is a time that mankind needs to realize there's only a short time. And you know who's going to give the warning? It's not going to be the lost world. It's going to be you and I that are saved. We need to get the word out. I think in our text verse is a detailed description of what took place in Noah's day. And if you look back at those two verses, verse 26 and verse 27, and it says, And as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it also be what? In the days of the Son of Man. It said they did eat. Okay, boy, they were, the people were eating, they were drinking, they were having a wonderful time, they were marrying and being given in marriage. And you know what? Everyone was just living life without one concern at all. And I think about what happened to them. They were outside the ark. When the flood came, it was too late. They could not be saved. And I think about it sounds the same as it is today in the nation and the world we live. It's exactly to that same point. I always thought that the Lord would come back when one more soul was saved. That was always my idea, but it's not that way. It was just like in the day of Noah, and we're going to see this. There was a time that came, it says, when God repented that he had made man. And why? Because sin was rampant in the world. We're seeing more today than we've ever seen before, and we're going to look at that this evening. And I think it also describes a society and culture that's living life. That's what's going on today. If it feels good, what's the old saying? Do it. That's the bottom line. And the world is not thinking about God and the consequence of their activity and their sin. I just got a chance to talk with somebody this week. I won't mention the name, but it was a good talk. Amen? And I described, I said, you know what this is? This is something to make you fireproof for eternity. Right. Never listen before, but listen now. Amen. And that's what the world needs. They haven't listened in the past, but the world, we need to take the message out and we need to give it whether they want to hear it or not, because if we don't, we're going to give account for it. Right. Amen. And I think what Christ was revealing was teaching us that the days prior to the flood are very similar to the days now before the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. It's the same. It's almost identical. And we'll look at some of that in just a moment. And it's not by accident that this is all taking place. I mean, God knows and God understands, and I think without a doubt, the similarity of these two events, the one with Noah and what's going on today, are almost identically the same. 
And so I want to look at some elements tonight that were present during the time of the flood and they're also present right now in the world that we live. Look at Genesis chapter 6 and verse number 5. I want you to see what was in the past, but it's also today the progression of sin. When God made man in the Garden of Eden, man was meant to live for how long? For eternity. But then we see that man disobeyed and sin came into existence, but it didn't just stay there. What happened? Sin began to get worse and worse and worse and worse. But look here what it says in Genesis 6, 5. It says, uh, and God saw that the wickedness of man was what? Great. Do you know that word? I looked it up. It means abundant or abounding. Sin was abundant. Sin was abounding. I mean, it was, it was everywhere. And it says, was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And I think about this. Sin is more openly visible today and more wicked today than it's ever been before. I don't care what anybody says. The liberals can say it's it's normal. No, it's sin. God hates it. And it's getting worse. It's not getting better. But then I want you to see some of the areas that we see this progression of sin. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 6, if you would, in verse number 14. I want you to see, first off, there's a lack of spiritual separation. And that's not only in the world. The world is, is not interested in spiritual things. But you know what we're seeing even in our church today? We're not seeing that separation, the spiritual separation it really needs to be. If we're walking the same way as the world is, why would the world want what we have? Amen. Come on. Look there what it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 14. It says, be not what? Unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Now, I think there's many areas that can include. But it goes on. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness, and what communion hath light with darkness? And by the way, I don't, we can't come totally out of the world. If we're not in the world, we won't be an influence. But I think we should never yoke up with the world. We should never yoke up with the ungodly. Amen. There's got to be a separation. People will say, well, why don't you run with them? As kindly as you say, because I don't believe in the sin of this world and I'm not going to get involved in this. And if we take a stand, you know what people do? They say, boy, they got something. They got something different than I have. And it's not with our nose stuck in the air with ENS syndrome. It's talking about being genuine, being sincere. But look what it goes on to say. It says in verse uh, 15, And what concord hath Christ with Belial, or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? Now notice this, for ye are the what? Temple of the living God, as God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Man, there needs to be a spiritual separation today. Amen. I think about even in Noah's day, they were separated from the rest of the crowd. You know what they were doing? They were doing the will of God. They were in the middle of God's will and they were working hard to accomplish what God wanted. And they had a separation there. Uh, God wanted uh, it then and he wants it now. He wants to see a separation in the, the believers from the world. We can't be out of the world, but we cannot go to the same excess the world does. We cannot get involved what they're involved in. Look at also 2 Corinthians 6 and look at down a couple verses. And, and here's the cause, okay? Look at what it says in verse 17. Wherefore, uh, for this cause, in other words, because there's no separation, wherefore, come out from among them and be a separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the what? Unclean thing, and I will receive you. Amen. And will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. I'll tell you what, God has not changed. He wanted it in Noah's day that there would be spiritual separation. He wants it today where you and I are separated unto him away from the sins of this world. But then look back at Genesis 6 and verse 5. Not only was there a lack of spiritual separation, but a lack of moral standards. Oh boy, Uh, does that sound anything familiar today? Look, it says there, and God saw that the wickedness of man was great and again abundant in the earth and that every, what's that next word? Imagination of their thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Well, I'll tell you what, the imagination of the heart, minds and hearts of people today is wicked. And you think of the immorality that's going on today. I've uh, been doing a little marriage counseling, and I said, you know, 50% of all marriages in America end up in divorce. Yeah. 
And if you're in a select group of career people, many of those, it's higher than 90%. Because if you can't contribute to what I'm doing, then I don't need you. That's a a moral problem right there. Amen? It's It's a wrong standard. And it sounds very familiar. Look at 2 Timothy 3, 1. And again, this goes on and it talks about the last days. Last days. It says in verse number 1 of chapter 3, This know also that in the last days, what kind of times? Perilous Perilous times shall come. And that word perilous is talking about dangerous, greater turning away from God than ever before. I don't know about anybody in here, but I never thought I would ever see sodomites out of the closet. Never thought you'd see that. I looked it up the other day. God's standard has never changed. God demands holiness. He demands righteousness. And He demands clean living from you and I that are saved. And you know what? The devil is putting it out before uh, those that are not saved and and those that are maybe weak Christians, the things of this world, and tempting with immorality. 7.1% of the United States population is sodomite. LGBT, somewhere in those lines. And you know what that that 7% is doing? It's causing the other 93% to dance to their tune. And it's not right. And you mark it down just as it was going down in Noah's day. The same thing is happening here. No spiritual separation. There's a lack of moral standards. It's not there. And God is watching everything that's going on. Look at 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 13. You and I need to realize that God wants us to live a righteous, holy life. It's not just words. It's what He wants. That's the will of God for our life. 1 Peter chapter 1, and verse 13, it says, Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end for the grace that is, is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As what kind of children? Obedient, Obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former what? Lust in your ignorance. Hey, that means don't go back to where you once were. Don't go back to the old life. Don't follow the things of the world. But then look at verse 15 and 16. But as he which hath called you is what? Holy. So be ye holy. And look at, there's that little word. What do you need to do with that little word? You need to circle that. It says, in, if he is holy, so be ye holy in All manner of conversation. That's not our words. That's our actions and our deeds. We need to be holy just like He is and He wants us to be holy. And then it goes on. It says, because it is written, be ye holy for I am holy. Boy, it won't be something to stand at the judgment seat of Christ and we're not going to give account for our sin. We've already talked about that. The sin was covered on the cross of Calvary and we accepted Jesus. But we're going to give account for the things we have done since the day we got saved. What we do, what we say, and not only that, but what we think. Amen. But here's another progression of sin. A lack of spiritual knowledge and discernment. You know, when we were looking over at Corinthians, that was one of the problems with the Corinthians. They were ignorant to a lot of the the spiritual things that were so very vitally important. And I think it's the same thing today. The world is lacking. They don't understand. I, I mentioned to the gentleman I was talking to yesterday, I said, you know, out in South Dakota, the Black Hills is famous for something. Anybody know what it is? Black Hills gold. Who lived in the Black Hills before the white man? The Indians did. And what did they do with the gold? Nothing. You know why? Because they didn't know what it was. They didn't understand it, so they never sought after it. Amen? And I think it's the same way. The lost man today, they have no interest in God. And if you don't have interest, guess what you're not going to do? You're not going to seek it. So that puts the burden on us. It puts the burden on you and I that we need to get out. We need to to witness. We need to give out the gospel. We need to tell people what the Bible says. Because we're living in a day where there's such uh, spiritual uh, ignorance and they have no knowledge of the Bible. Look at Luke 17 and verse 26 and verse 27. In verse number 26 of Luke 17 it says... And as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be also in the days of the Son of Man. They did eat, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage until the day Noah entered into the ark and the flood came. And look at that last phrase, and what? Destroyed them. Why were they destroyed? I believe they were destroyed because of ignorance. 
They did not understand. They did not know. They didn't care to know. And as a result, when the doors on the ark were closed, it was too late. They could have cried. They could have hollered. It was too late. And I think about how mankind and the world is blind to the Scripture. Uh, look, if you would, at first, or 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse number 3. Satan's still working, folks. Don't kid yourself. He's going to work harder in these last days before the return of Christ than he's ever worked before. And I said this, when somebody gets caught doing wrong, they never want to go down what? Alone. Alone. They want to take somebody with them. And the devil is no different. Look there, if you would, at chapter 4 and verse 3. It says, but if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are what? lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Boy, the progression of sin, it was in the day of Noah, it's today, but it's even far greater today than it's ever been. But then look back at Genesis 6 and look at verse number 7. I want you to see back in that day that there was a prophesied destruction. I mean, God told him back in Genesis that he was going to destroy mankind. But mankind didn't believe it. Look at Genesis 6 and verse 7. And the Lord, what? Said, I will, I will destroy man who am created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and creeping thing, and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. I don't know about you, that sounds like a warning. That sounds like something brought forth saying, listen, I'm going to destroy everything. The sin is wicked. It's no different today. God warned the destruction was coming, but mankind didn't listen. Didn't listen at all. Just went about their business, did what they wanted, was unconcerned. And I think about this. Also, the Lord has given us warning. Look, if you would, at 1 Thessalonians and look at chapter uh, number 4 and verse 13. 1 Thessalonians. Let me get over there. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse number 13. I mean, we've had warning upon warning. The world has seen it. The world has heard it. But I don't think anybody's ever really believed it. Look at there chapter 4 and verse number 13. I'll get over there, man. I'm... Verse number 13. And it says, but I would not have you to be what? Ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain under the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself, look at here it is, the Lord himself shall what? Descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Amen. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. I don't know about you, but that sounds like a warning to me. The day's coming when the Lord's going to come back. He's going to take out his, his saved. He's going to resurrect the dead. And they're all going with him to heaven. That's a warning from God. It's the same as it was in the day of Noah. But the word's not getting out. And I'm telling you, I think Brother Phillips, when he was here, I've mentioned it several times, he made the comment, we need to do more than just say, where are you going to go when you die? You need to say, you know what, there's somebody that loved you, somebody gave their life for you, and if you don't accept them, the only thing you have is a lake of fire to go to. Amen. I made a comment to the gentleman. I said, I want to show you how to be fireproof for eternity. And the man says, I'm not interested in seeing any more fire. Amen. Amen. But then look at Ezekiel chapter 3 and verse 16. We see the, the prophesied destruction and tribulation. God warned them all the way back then. He told of the rapture to you and I today. But I think about there's a storm that lies ahead. And it's yet before us. And the judgment that's going to come with it is beyond the comprehension of mankind. I can't even fathom what it's going to be like. Uh, you know, Brother Vineyard used to say this, the mankind that's left is going to be looking for places to hide and, and to, to get away, and, and you won't be able to take your own life. He said, you put a shotgun under your chin and blow your brains out, and you're still alive, you can't die. 
I don't know about you, that's a, a pretty devastating illustration of what's going to happen. But look at there at Ezekiel chapter 3 and verse 16. And we see the storm approaching. Everybody in here tonight that's saved and saved for any length of time, you see the progressions of what's going on, and it's just ahead of us. But Ezekiel chapter 3 and verse 16, And it came to pass at the end of seven days that the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, I have made thee a watchman in the house of Israel. Therefore hear the word at my mouth and give them warning for me. Whose responsibility is it? It's ours. It's yours and it's mine. And it goes on. He said, I've made thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore, hear the word at my mouth and give them warning from me. When I say unto the wicked, thou shalt surely die, and thou givest him not warning, nor speakest to warn the wicked from his wicked way to save his life. The same wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood will what? I require at thine hand. We see the storm coming. That's like tornadoes. This is Tornado Alley. Now, what a, a warning is the first thing, but a watch is the next thing, right? If we know that a tornado is in the area and we have a neighbor that does not have anywhere to get out of the storm, guess what? We're not doing our job. We need to be warning, just like a tornado's coming, you don't want to see anybody get hurt, you don't want to see anybody get killed. We, need, we see the storm coming that God's going to bring on the world after the rapture takes place, and we need to be the watchman giving a warning. Amen. Amen. And if we don't, guess what? Their blood will be on our hands. And verse 19 of that same chapter said, Yet if thou warn the wicked, and he turn not from his wickedness, nor from his wicked way, he shall die in his iniquity, but thou shalt, be, shalt hast delivered thy soul. You know, we, we got to get the gospel out. Amen. That doesn't mean they're going to receive it. Amen? Amen. That's like, like a newspaper boy. My wife and I, we threw 650 daily, 750 Sundays for over five years. Our job was to deliver the paper. Do you know what? It wasn't our responsibility to push in what was in the paper down their throat, but we had to get it out. Amen. And it's the same thing for you and I today. Look over at Revelation chapter 15 and verse 1. And again, we're talking about the, the storm and the tribulation that still lies ahead. Look here at, you, at chapter 15 of Revelation and verse number 1. We need to be diligent to give out the warning. Because right there it is in Revelation 15, it says, And I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last, what? Plagues. Plagues. For in them is filled up the, what? Wrath. Wrath of God. Boy, I wonder tonight, are we getting the message out the way we should? But I thought about this. You know, even in the day of Noah, God did not want to see man die. He did not want to see man perish. You know, I want to look at our preserving Savior. Our Savior came to this earth for one specific reason. You know what that was? That he would suffer, he would bleed, and he would die. That mankind would be able to be saved. Amen. Look at Genesis chapter 6 and verse 5 and 6 again. And we see there it says that God saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts that of, of his heart were only evil continually. But notice in verse number 6, and it said, And it what? Repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth. It grieved him at his heart. You know what? That word repent in the context right there means to be sorry. He was sorry that he'd made man because of how man was in turn treating him. And I think about how that he was watching, he watched everything that was going on, and he was recording it all too, until that day it came to the point he could no longer take any more. But you know what? He preserved mankind as long as he could, giving them a chance, and I think it's the exact same thing he's doing today. God's eye is on everything. Over in the book of Proverbs, you don't have to turn, verse 3, it says, the eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the good and evil. He's watching just as he did back in those days. And the fact that he was grieved, he was grieved then, guess what? He's grieved today. He's grieved when he looks down on this world that's over 2,000 years since he died on that cross and he bled and paid the price for all of mankind. He's still grieved today. He, he's broken hearted over what's going on. But you know what he's doing? He's still trying to preserve mankind. 
He is. He's still trying to do it. And again, in verse 6, it said, It repented the Lord that He had made them. Uh, he was sorry, uh, and it's no different today. God is still brokenhearted. But here's, here's the thing. He's not giving up. And I'm glad tonight. I'm glad that he didn't give up on me. Uh, I was 27 years old living in sin, but he didn't give up. He still loved me and he was concerned about me. But I think about how that as he worked in the day of Noah, he's still working today. No matter how bad things get, God is still working. He's still trying to preserve mankind. It's the creation that was made after the likeness of God. Amen? And he doesn't want any to perish. And he's doing what only he can do. He's the one that really reveals the sin. We may give the message, but he's the one that reveals it to the heart of man. He's also the one, the only one that can save the lost. Uh, he's still, he's holding on. He's trying to preserve man from going to a lake of fire. In Psalm chapter 121 and verse 1 through 4, it says this. I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills from whence cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord which made heaven and earth. He will not suffer thy foot to be moved. He hath keepeth thee, will not slumber. Behold, he that keepeth Israel shall neither slumber or sleep. I'm glad we have a preserving Savior that he's not giving up. Just like in Noah's day, he's, he's not giving up on mankind. But listen, the day's coming when he's going to say, that's it. Look over, if you would, at 2 Peter 2, 5. I want you to see this last thing. In those days, he had a faithful witness. I believe that was Noah. And I think without a doubt that the coming judgment, Noah knew that God was planning to destroy the earth because he was building that vessel. And he went for how many years building the vessel? 120 years. You know what that was? That was a 120-year grace period for mankind on the face of the earth. I think of what's the grace period for mankind now? The grace period from the time that Jesus died on the cross and rose from the grave, it's over 2,000 years. He's been giving man another chance. Amen? Right. And I think about 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 5. Uh, and, and spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. God could have destroyed everything instantly, but again, it was the grace of God that prevailed, hoping that mankind would get saved. Now listen, tonight, back in those days, God had a faithful witness. His name was Noah. And you know, God has the same thing today in this country, in this world we live. And you know whose names they are? You and me. I wonder tonight if we're in the will of God as we looked at for three weeks and we realize that the end is approaching, what are we doing? Super Saturday soul winning. You said, boy, that was really uh, convenient, wasn't it? Yes, it was. Super Saturday soul winning is on Saturday. You know what it's an opportunity to do? It's an opportunity to go out and put an invitation to come yeah. to church. And it's not only an invitation to come to church, but on the back is the gospel message of how people can get saved. Right. And by the way, we have no excuse because he's given us all the tools. He's given us the word of God. He's given us the spirit of God. You know, I realize there are some that like to take Acts chapter 1 and verse 8 and use it in another context. But look at Acts chapter 1, 8 and see the main reason that verse was given and what it's applying to. Right. Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, it says, But ye shall receive what? Power. What kind of power? The power of God. After the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be, here's the key, what is it? Ye shall be witnesses unto me in both Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and the uttermost parts of the earth. And I think about also, you could look over there, we won't, but 2 Corinthians 5, 19, it says, He has given us the word of what? Reconciliation. You know what that is? This right here, this book can reconcile a lost, hell-doomed sinner it back into the graces of God. Amen? And you and I, we need to be about it. He's given us a command. It's not an option, by the way. Uh, let me read Matthew 28, verse 10, uh, 20. It says, Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have, what? Commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Boy, He's given us what we need. We have everything we need, and it's a command from God. But then I think also of how we have an obligation and a responsibility to go and tell. Every one of us. And I'm being redundant over this, but I'm trying to get a point across. 
We're having Super Saturday soul winning. We live in a community that I don't know if anybody else is doing what Faith Baptist Church is doing. Going out and knocking doors or they go by constantly. We're leaving invitations to different events at the church. And listen, that's our responsibility. It's not just pastor's responsibility. Right. Amen? It's all of us, those who are saved. And I think we've, we've no idea if we'll see results. You can go out and hand that out. You have no idea. But you know what I'm looking forward to? I'm looking forward to getting to heaven and having somebody say, Hey, I don't know your name, but you know what? You gave me a track. You gave me an invitation. And I read it. I got saved. And look where I'm at today. Amen. Amen. Right. Amen. When Noah was... Building the ark, he did what he could to get the rest of the people to come with him. But you know what? Once he was in that ark, he had rest. You know, there'll be time for rest in eternity. But you know, there's no R&R. &R, there's no, no vacation in the Christian life. And I think sometimes people think that. They think, well, I don't have to do it this week. I wonder, every time we say that, how many people die in our area that we didn't get out when we should have, and we said we'll do it another day. We see the end approaching, folks, and we need to be doing something about it. I'm glad tonight that I got saved, and I won't have to experience the great tribulation. I'm glad of that. I'm not going to have to stand at the great white throne judgment and hear the Lord say, Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. And I won't have to be in that lake of fire. Yes. And you ought to be glad of that tonight too. But the lost world is what we need to be concerned about. You say, well, it's just not in my character type to go out and hand out tracts. It's not in my job description to go out and knock on a door. You glad somebody knocked on yours? You glad somebody handed you a track? Are you glad somebody invited you? I wonder tonight, are we doing our very best to reach those around us because we see the end approaching? And when the rapture takes place, a lot of people will never, ever have another opportunity. We need to get the gospel out. Let's bow our heads, please. Father, I thank you tonight for these that have come out and, and listened, Lord. But I pray that we would do more than listen when the Word of God is preached. I pray that we would apply it in our life and we'd be active. I wonder tonight if there might be somebody in this building, just one, that might say, if I was to die right now, I'm not even sure I'm going to heaven, Lord. I pray that tonight, that would be the night they would get saved. Anybody tonight would say, just pray for me. I'm not sure I'm saved. I don't want to die and go to a lake of fire. Just remember me, anybody like that tonight? I wonder how many tonight would be honest and say, I really not, never thought about the end. I've not considered the end of time and what's going to happen and what I need to do before that time comes. I wonder this evening how many in this building your prayer would be that you want to step up and you want to be the witness God wants you to be because you see the end approaching and you know what's going to happen. How many tonight your prayer would be, Lord, I want to be aware of it, but I want to be more than aware. I want to do something about it. I want to be a witness for you. How many of that would be your prayer? Let me see your hand tonight. Slip it up. Amen. Father, you know the hands tonight. You know the needs. I do pray, Father, that you would speak to our hearts and not just speak, but I pray you'd move our feet, Lord, that we would commit ourselves to living for you and being a witness for the glory of God. Bless the invitation tonight, Lord, please, as only you can, and we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Let's stand as Miss Ruth plays. Come on. <laughs>